series, we looked at what it means to be blessed, to be a blessing. The next week we looked at blessing the city. And this morning, we're gonna be looking at the blessing that no one wants, the blessing of sacrifice. You might be surprised to know it was also the sermon that nobody wanted, (laughs) which is why I got given it. (laughs) The blessing of sacrifice. I want to start with a story uh, that's been told about a local rabbi who for a whole year had been working hard to teach his unruly class of young people all the stories of the Torah, the first five books in the Bible. But sadly, his efforts were largely fruitless. So he tried to make the final test as easy as possible. He asked a boy at the back of the class, who destroyed the walls of Jericho? Please, sir, it wasn't me, said the boy. (laughs) Annoyed, the rabbi reported the answer to the boy's parents. The parents were indignant. If our son said it wasn't him, it wasn't him, they said. (laughs) Even more dismayed at the ignorance of his people, the rabbi went to the president of the congregation and told him the story. The president listened with concern, went to his desk, opened the drawer and took out a checkbook. Look, he said, here's a thousand dollars, get the walls repaired and don't say anything about it publicly. (laughs) As this funny little tale um, highlights, there are stories that need to get passed on from one generation to the next. Stories that help us understand who we are, where we came from, why we're here. You see, all of us as human beings are asking ourselves this question. What am I meant to be doing with my life? You may have even asked yourself this question this week. What am I meant to be doing with my life? But as the philosopher Alastair McIntyre observes, I can only answer the question, what am I to do, if I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself a part? And over the last few weeks, This is a question that we've been asking ourselves as a community, as we have walked through the pages of Scripture. What story do we find ourselves a part? And this is so important. It's why the Bible remains perpetually relevant, even in an age of science. You see, science can tell us what we are made of. Only God's Word can tell us what we are made for. And as we've looked at the Bible, we've seen that our story as human beings goes all the way back to a garden where the very first man and woman were created to live as God's divine image bearers in this world, to be fruitful and to multiply. In other words, to build families and schools and hospitals and make music and plant crops, bring God's order and beauty, cultivate that across this entire world. But instead of trusting in God's goodness and obeying Him, they decided to break the constraints that God had laid down for them by doing the one thing, the only thing that God said not to do, which was to reach for the knowledge of good and evil without God. And we see that ever since, we as human beings have been alienated from God, alienated from each other, alienated from ourselves and alienated from the earth. But then we saw in the story of Abraham, a ray of hope. For just as the damage had been done by disobedience to God's Word, so the way back was going to involve learning to to trust and to obey that Word. And so God spoke to Abraham with a call to follow and Abraham gained the title, very cool title, Friend of God. Why? Because he trusted and obeyed by responding to God's Word call with a yes. Of course, as a fallible human being like you and me and particularly that guy over there. It was Cameron, in case you're wondering who I'm pointing to. Abraham didn't get everything right, but he got the main thing right, which was to respond to the call of God by saying, yes, I will follow your call. You're calling me to leave Haran? Okay, I will leave Haran. You're calling me to sacrifice the most precious thing in my life to you, my son Isaac. Okay, 
I will trust you, God. And you say that through my offspring, you will bless the whole world. Okay, I will trust you. And Abraham becomes the father of an entire nation. And from Abraham's offspring, we have the nation of Israel whom God rescues from slavery and oppression of the Egyptians in the Exodus. And at Sinai, he gives them his law, not as the means by which they can earn their way to become the people of God, but to show them how to live as a people of God that by God's grace, they already are, that they might fulfill their call to be a light to the nations, to be blessed, to be a blessing. And as we saw last week, even in the Babylonian exile, God's people learn that their calling to bless the nations has not been revoked just because Jerusalem has become captive to a foreign nation. Even in pagan Babylon, they are not to live self-protective, self-interested lives, but are called in the words of the prophet Jeremiah to seek the peace and the prosperity of the city, to live in a nation that doesn't worship the one true God as a light pointing to the one true God. And we see sparks of that light in the story of Daniel and in his mates, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And even when they're threatened with a fiery furnace for refusing to worship and bow down to the golden image, they are able to stand before the most powerful king in the world, and proclaim the existence of another kingdom and another king. They said, even if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And then we read in the rest of the Old Testament that when the exiles eventually do return from captivity to Jerusalem and rebuild the ruins of the walls and rebuild the nightmare of the destruction of the temple, God's temple, and they rebuild that. There's huge celebration and huge joy, but it's also still tinged with some sadness because their return has only partially fulfilled the promises to Abraham to be a blessing to all the nations. And so they still looked with hope to the future to one day when the promises would be fulfilled. The prophet Malachi, for example, speaks of a day when the Lord's messenger would come and prepare the way for the son of righteousness with healing in his rays, a redeemer for Israel. And so this morning, we come to the high point of God's purposes for the nation of Israel, God's people revealed in the person of Jesus who comes from the line of Adam, from the line of Abraham, from the line of David. But rather surprisingly, imagine if you're reading the story for the first time, This Jesus is not born in a palace, but in a dirty stable. He's not brought up in Rome and not even in Jerusalem, but in an obscure village on the fringe of the Roman Empire known as Nazareth. He sweats at a carpenter's bench to pay for his family, his mother and his younger siblings. At the age of, not until 30 does he begin his teaching and healing and proclaiming the good news that the kingdom of God is available for all. He has few possessions, no home, no place on which to rest his head. He travels on foot, ministering from village to village. Those who follow him are ordinary people, fishermen and the like. He makes friends with prostitutes and publicans and lays hands on lepers and outcasts. As Chuck Colson writes, Jesus just simply did not act according to people's expectations. He didn't placate the crowds that followed him. Instead, he spoke to them in mysterious parables and hard sayings. He annoyed and outraged those in power, even as he healed and helped the poor. He was gentle yet strong, supremely confident yet humble. He spoke of the kingdom, not of this world. He was not the Messiah that people were expecting because by the time of Jesus, the kingdom of God had become to the Jewish mind a setting up of a power base from which God would rule the world through his people with strength and with power. Jesus showed them that the rule of God would not be by the force of might, but by the force of love, sacrificial love. There's a new movie coming out about Napoleon Bonaparte. Has anyone seen that one coming along? 
Yeah, it's, has, it, has anyone seen it yet? Has it come out yet? Came out yesterday. Okay, did you see it? Okay. It promises to be epic. Why? Because Napoleon was probably the greatest conqueror this earth has ever seen. And yet even Napoleon is said to have remarked that between Jesus and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. He said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne and myself founded empires. But upon what were these empires founded? Upon what foundation did we rest the creation of our genius? Very humble man, Napoleon. He says, upon force. Our empires were founded upon force, but Jesus Christ, he said, founded an empire upon love and at this hour, millions of men would die for him. It took a while for Jesus' disciples to get the message that Jesus' kingdom would not be by power, but by sacrificial love. Remember, they argued amongst themselves as to who would be the greatest among them. Embarrassingly, I think this is so embarrassing, the sons of thunder got their mum to sort of plead for them that they would be the most important in the kingdom. I would never do anything like that, would I, mum? Never, no. <laughs> no. But Jesus, the, their mindset was still about self-empowerment, self-protectiveness, self-actualization, self-interest. But what was it that Jesus had to teach them? That the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. No wonder even his followers weren't sure whether Jesus really was the Messiah. And so do you remember the question that Jesus put to his followers at Caesarea Philippi? Who do people say that I am? Some say you are John the Baptist, the disciples replied. Others say Elijah and still others that you are Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus looked into the eyes of those who had left everything to follow him. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? To which the irrepressible Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And you can almost imagine a hush in heaven. The words had finally been spoken. The whole world would know. The Messiah had come. But even more than that, the Messiah was not just a man. He was God come in human flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Such revelation, Jesus said, could only have come from, from God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was revealed to you, not by man, but by my Father in heaven. And Jesus' next words are crucial. Get this, because in direct response to Peter's confession, Jesus says, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, on the confession of Christ as Lord, Jesus is going to build his church, a new community in human history. This community is going to become God's primary instrument of blessing for his planet. Now, the Greek word church in the New Testament is Ecclesia. Yes. Paul, come on. That was your, that was, you got it. You got there. You got there. You had me worried, but you got there. The Greek word is Ecclesia, yes, very good. Which to the culture at large meant a public assembly of people. It was used when they were called out to vote. But interestingly, its Hebrew counterpart, Q-A-L-A-L, also meant the congregation of Israel constituted at Sinai and assembled before the Lord. It meant those that he brought together and called by his name, the people of God. So in Jesus' declaration that he will build the church, we understand that he's not just speaking about a new collection of people, but of the new collection of the people of God. Israel's hope 
that they were longing for of a deeper restoration and fulfillment of the promises to Abraham are finally to be fulfilled in Jesus and his followers, both Jews and in time to come, Gentiles as well. Just as Simeon had prophesied over the infant Jesus, he will be a light to reveal God to the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. And since the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on those early believers who had been witnesses to Jesus' life and death and resurrection, and when Peter publicly proclaimed the Lordship of the risen Christ and 3,000 people gave their life to God, the church is being made up of people from every nation and tribe and people and tongue, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart for God. Chuck Colson writes, The church is no civic centre, no social club or encounter group, no Sunday morning meeting place. It is a new society created for a lost world pointing to the kingdom to come. And as has been said by many a preacher over the years, God has only one plan to reach the world. It is called the church. He does not have a plan B. And I think the question for each one of us this morning is, have we responded to this call? The call to be the people of God for this generation. A call that goes beyond simply personal fulfilment or self-actualization, but a call to be a light to those around us, a blessing to the world, to be proclaimers of the existence of another kind of life, a different kingdom the kingdom of God made available for all who would enter through it and into it through the life and death and resurrection of the servant king himself, Jesus Christ. That life that we have been invited to and that we're called others, invite others into is an eternal life in interactive living relationship with God and in his kingdom. This is eternal life, says the Bible that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, that they know you. It's it's interactive living knowledge. But we can't experience that life unless we are willing to step into God's kingdom. But we can't step into God's kingdom, Jesus says, unless we are willing to walk in the way of sacrificial love that Jesus himself walked. That is to say, unless using the language of Jesus, so this is not my language, so don't blame me. This is Jesus's language. Unless using the language of Jesus, we are willing to die. As we read in John chapter 12, Jesus says, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. In his book, The Call, Os Guinness tells a story about a man named Arthur Burns, who was quite prominent in the US government. He used to be an advisor to presidents. He headed up the uh, Federal Reserve Board. In other words, when he spoke, Washington listened. And there was a group that met in the White House for informal fellowship and prayer. And Arthur Burns began attending the group. And this was surprising because not only was Burns kind of a big deal, he was also Jewish. And yet there he was week after week. Burns never led in prayer and no one ever asked him to pray because prayers were voluntary and no no one wanted to push Burns out of respect for his position, but also for his Jewish faith. But on one occasion... a a newcomer in the group turned to Arthur Burns and asked him to close in prayer. The The veterans of the group leaned in closely to see what would happen. Without missing a beat, Burns reached out, held hands with others in that circle and prayed this prayer. Lord, I pray that you would bring Jews to know Jesus Christ. I pray that you would bring Muslims to know Jesus Christ. Finally, Lord, I pray that you would bring Christians to know Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Oz writes that Arthur Byrne's prayer became legendary in Washington. Not only did he startle those there with his refreshing directness, but he also underscored a point about Christians and Christianity that a Christian's not just anyone who goes by that name. A Christian is someone who's responded to the call to leave everything to follow Jesus. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Bonhoeffer writes, the cross is laid on every Christian. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins, the cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. In other words, we cannot step into the kingdom of God unless we're willing to let go of our own kingdom. God's kingdom, as Dallas Willard defines it, is the range of God's effective will where what he wants done is done. Whereas our kingdom is the range of our effective will where what we want done is done. And as Willard explains, our kingdoms start off rather small when as little children, we discover that we can actually make things happen in the world. You get to observe this dynamic as you watch your children growing up. I remember seeing it for the first time with our oldest child, Grace. For Grace, the realisation that she could make things happen in the world began with the discovery of her right index finger. She was about five or six months old and this incredible discovery fascinated her for days. This thing that she could bend if she wanted to and straighten if she wanted to, if she decided. The intoxicating thing here was that this was something that she could control direct because it was her finger. Now, eventually she discovered she had other fingers as well and hands and, and, and feet and toes and legs and a voice. And each time as she made those first little choices about what she would do with her hands and, and, and her voice, Tash and I would say to each other, look at what she just did. Or did you hear what she just said? We so cherished and valued her individuality, her creativity as we have for each of our three kids, as we've seen them grow. And this is what makes you and I so incredible. We are made in the image of God. And part of that is we have the ability to make genuine choices that we don't, not everything that we do is just not acting on pure animal instinct or biological determinism. As human beings, we have the capacity to create or to bring something new into this universe every time we make a choice because it's from our heart or our will that we make our choices and it's from our heart or our will that we decide the most important thing of all, which is what we love. From the Bible's perspective, the most destiny-defining thing about each and every one of us is what we choose to love above all else. It's on that which we build our kingdoms. It isn't long before we discover that we have a kingdom. It may start with a little finger, but over the years that kingdom grows. For example, what are a two-year-old's favourite words? No and mine. (laughs) Mine. These are, says Dallas Willard, important words because they are kingdom words, words that are about defining the realm of what we say goes. And so our ability to choose, it's precious, but you might have noticed it's also a problem because our will, our will is not the only reality in the universe. What happens when our will runs into something that doesn't want to cooperate like a toy that runs out of batteries or like a brother or a sister? Hands up if you grew up with one or more siblings. Okay, most people. If so, can you remember the first thing kids do when they get in the back seat of a car? They draw a line down the middle and they say, don't you cross that line. They're learning about their kingdom. And then what do they do? They violate each other's kingdoms. 
and they bicker and they fight. And then mum or dad who's driving the car gets upset because whose kingdom does the parent think the car is? Their kingdom. And there you have in microcosm a picture of our problem that our little kingdoms, as we try to expand them, come into contact with other little kingdoms. And then what do we have? Kingdoms in conflict. That's the human condition. In a way, we're all like individual ships sailing, trying to navigate our way through life. But the thing is, we've got to share this ocean with other ships, other sailing ships. We would love to be able to sail however, whenever, with whoever, and how, whenever we want to, to pursue whatever we think will make us happy, whether it be the pursuit of pleasure, finding our own paradise island, or the pursuit of fame, being recognised wherever we go, or the pursuit of relationships, hanging out with the the tall ships or, 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 or status, becoming known as a great sailing ship or power, capturing or dominating other sailing ships or wealth, making lots of, finding lots of treasure or beauty, having the best looking ships with the most curvaceous looking sails. You know, you get the idea. We set sail for that which we love, that which we value as an ultimate good, but the problem is twofold. Firstly, the ocean of life is relatively unpredictable predictable. Sometimes there are storms and waves that can threaten to overwhelm our boats. And secondly, there are lots and lots of other ships in the sea and they have their sights set on the things that they want as well. And sometimes them pursuing the things they want gets in the way of us pursuing the things we want because we want the same thing. And when that happens, what do we do? We get the cannons out, boom. Or we grab the steering wheel and we withdraw. And these two responses, attack and withdrawal, tend to characterise human relationships. And these battles get fought every day by people who work in the same business or between people who work in the same charity or the same sporting team or live in the same house, between people who are meant to be brothers and sisters, between husbands and wives and parents and children. And that's why our lives are characterised by stress and anxiety as we're torn between competing emotions of fear and desire. We desire the things out in the ocean that we want, that we think will make us happy, but we fear the things that could sink our ship if we venture out into the ocean to get them. We fear the other ships, what they might do to us. We fear the unpredictable nature of life on the sea, the storms and the, and the waves threaten to sink us. This is not how God created us to live. Leo Tolstoy, perhaps the world's greatest novelist, diagnoses the situation like this. He says that each person is a natural egoist who lives as if it were a novel in which he or she were the hero or the heroine, but the truly good life begins, he says, when a person can see the world as if they were a minor character in someone else's novel. And the Bible echoes this sentiment. It says that we weren't meant to live a life of fear in our own little kingdom, in our own little boat, in our own little story. It says we were meant to live in a much bigger story, a much bigger kingdom, in God's kingdom, in God's story. In other words, this universe, it's not all about you. It's about me. No, God says it's not about me either. It's about God. This world is His world. He made it, He loves it, He owns it. And we're sort of like rebels trying to set up our little castles in somebody else's kingdom. But the castles that we think will bring us freedom become our own lonely little prisons, which is about a good a description of hell as you can possibly get. So what happens if you choose to stop living for yourself as the hero of the story and to start living for God as part of his story where he is the hero? Well, it's kind of like this. Instead of attacking other boats with your cannons or withdrawing away to some lonely high island harbour and hoping no one will bother you, you hear a voice. It's Jesus' voice. And this is what he says. Get out of the boat. Get out of your little boat. It's floating on my ocean anyway. Get out of the boat, put your hand in mine and I will show you how to walk on water. How to live a supernatural life of love where you rely entirely on me to keep you afloat. It's a life of faith and freedom, risk and adventure, but there's no safer place in the world to be. 
And it's both the easiest thing in the world to do and it's the hardest thing in the world to do. It's the hardest thing because you have to surrender everything to Jesus and trust Him that He knows best. But it's also the easiest thing to do because all you have to do is surrender, let go and allow Christ to be the one who directs and manages your life. C.S. Lewis, as usual, says it so well. And so I'm gonna read out a lengthy quote. He says, the terrible thing, the most impossible thing is to hand over your whole self, all your wishes and precautions to Christ. But it is far easier than what we're trying to do. For what we are trying to do is to remain what we call ourselves, to keep personal happiness as our great aim in life and yet at the same time be good. We are all trying to let our mind and heart go their own way, centred on money or pleasure or ambition and hoping in spite of this to behave honestly and chastely and humbly. And that is exactly what Christ warned you could not do. As he said, a thistle cannot produce figs. If I am a field that contains nothing but grass seed, I cannot produce wheat. Cutting the grass may keep it short, but I shall still produce grass and no wheat. If I want to produce wheat, the change must go deeper than the surface. I must be ploughed up and re-sown. Letting go of your own little kingdom where you call the shops and stepping into God's kingdom where he calls the shots, it sounds scary, but it's totally worth it. And that's because knowing Jesus is the best thing in the world. And that's because Jesus is everything your heart has ever wanted, even if you've never fully realised it yet. He's your heart's true home. Living in the kingdom of God, we learn how to live life from the creator of life, the one who really knows what life is meant to be and how to live it well. Learning to love not just those who are lovable, but those who are difficult and undeserving, just as Christ loved me. In short, learning what it means to be blessed, to be a blessing, to love and to be loved from he who is the source of all blessing and all love in community with the rest of God's people who are on the same journey with us. Even if somehow you could master all the things in the world according to your will, you would still be unhappy and unfulfilled because you would not be living who you were created to be or doing what you were created to do. And so here's the amazing truth. The pursuit of glorifying God and laying down your life for Him is the same as your pursuit of joy. The two are the same. As the Bible says, it was for the joy that was set before Him that Christ endured the cross, despising its Shame. True joy is found in serving Jesus. It's what we were made for and what we were saved for. It's a bit like the story of the violin who tried to, this violin, it tried to hide in its case every time its owner walked past for fear that the owner would make the violin do some work like the other instruments in the house. The violin was very comfortable in its case and feared the idea of work and service until one day the owner picked up the violin for the first time. This is it, thought the violin. My lovely days of leisure and pleasure are over. This is going to hurt. And it did hurt a little at the beginning as the owner did a bit of tuning. But then the incredible happened. The violin began to feel the most amazing joy and fulfilment, more than it ever imagined life could possibly give as beautiful music flowed from its strings under the expert guidance of the owner. For the violin wasn't made to sit in a protective case all the days of its life. It was meant to be used as it served its master faithfully in the creation of beautiful music. Far from being a duty, service in the hands of the master became the violin's privilege and desire. Never had it felt so energised and alive. My food, my sustenance, my energy, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Can you imagine it should be any different 
for we who follow him. My hope and prayer for all of us this morning as a local expression of God's worldwide church here in South Bucks is that each and every one of us would come to know and experience this life of adventure and love that we were made for and that we enter in through faith and obedience to God's call to let go of our kingdoms and to step into His. Like Abraham did, like Daniel and his friends did, like Peter and the other disciples did, and like those first followers of Jesus at Pentecost did. For when the church is truly the church, the people of God, moved by the Spirit of God, do the work of God, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. Let's pray. As we bow our heads this morning, I'm going to invite Tash to come up and to pray for us. We just take a a moment just of stillness um, and just invite the Holy Spirit to just come and speak to you. If you're not familiar with the Holy Spirit, you know, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit as our counsellor, as our comforter as the one who brings illumination to our heart, as our friend. He speaks Jesus' words to us. So why don't we just invite him just in a, in a moment, just, just for now, just invite him to come in this stillness and speak to you. My sense um, this morning was that for some of you, the Lord Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart and is saying, who do you say I am? Who am I to you this morning? Am I a good teacher? Am I a little baby in a manger? Am I a prophet? Am I someone that you just come to when things are going wrong in your life? Or are you ready for me to be Lord, to be your God? You know, the Lord Lord God, He's so kind, He's so gentle. He only comes where He's really wanted. And so I pray if that's you this morning, Perhaps your prayer is, I I want to want you, God. And I just want you to know that the Lord will take that. He'll take that prayer. He'll take just even the little wick that's still burning. He will take that and He will fan that into flame. And so if there's someone here this morning who would like to live life with you, Jesus, and to be called your friend and to enjoy friendship with you, I pray that they would meet you, Jesus, today as their friend, as the one that they're going to trust their life with, as the one they're going to lay everything down for. And I pray that they would have the courage to step out of the boat and trust that, Lord, you will hold them and you will carry them through this life. And so I pray even now, Lord, just pour out the blessing of your presence upon them. And then I just had a sense that maybe for some of you, um, there's, and it could be totally wrong, there's some relational fracturedness in your life right now. And so I just want to pray for you that you um, would come to a place of being able to be uh, the oil of love in that relationship this Christmas time. 
that forgiveness and grace would flow through you into that relationship, that something would shift in that relationship. There would be um, a, a deepening of friendship through, through the healing of brokenness there. So Lord, I just pray into that, Lord. Lord, would you work in relationships that have perhaps broken down, Lord, that you would bring about reconciliation, Lord, that you would bring about newness there, Lord, that um, you would work through that, Lord, and bring hope into that relationship, Lord, where perhaps there's only been heartache. I pray, Lord, do what only you can do, Lord. 